here we are. Let's make a start. Um, so this is this is a topic that I'm very very interested in and have done a fair bit of reading on, uh, and also um, just have a bunch of years of experience in business. And I've learned the hard way um, when you price things wrong, um, what happens. Uh, I've been in business since 2007. We we started our um, Pilates studio in Melbourne. We opened. We actually started hiring people and renovating stuff in in late 2006. But we actually opened the doors in March 2007, and we I ran that for ten years, and uh, grew it quite a, quite big. Um, and then we uh, then I sold my interest in the studio in 2015 and started Breathe Education, and we've been doing Breathe Education ever since. So uh, it certainly hasn't for me hasn't been a totally smooth ride. There've definitely been times when. Uh, I didn't know if the business would survive. There were times when I was thinking, what the hell was I thinking? You know, starting a business wouldn't it, it would have been so much better if I just got and got a job. <laughs> um, and, uh, there've also been lots of, of highs, you know, and, and the, the, the positive, you know, vastly outweighs the, the hard times in my personal experience. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of what, so I guess just to preface what I'm going to share with you. Uh, I've learned a lot from, you know, reading. There's there's a whole uh, academic literature on pricing and pricing theory. Um, and so I've, I've read, you know, fairly widely in that and also um, just made a lot of mistakes and, you know, by luck found out some things that do work. Um, so that's, that's what I'm going to share with you today. What I'm going to share is, it's my opinion. You know, I don't, I'm, I, I, I don't doubt that there are smart people in the world who uh, will disagree. So you can take it with a grain of salt to whatever, you know, or, or take it on board, but I'd love to hear what you think about it. So basically, uh, I think, you know, you've got a pricing problem if you're working really hard and not making enough money, right? Cause that says that you're selling your time for cheaper than you can afford to, you know, cause if you're not busy and you're not making enough money, well, just get more clients, right? Get more clients, make more money. But if you already have a bunch of clients and you're working really hard and you're not making enough money, that says that really screams to me, you're not charging enough to the clients that you do have. So that's one thing. Second thing is if you price your services based on what everyone else is charging. And I think that's probably almost universal in the Pilates world. I see Several times a week, almost daily, I reckon, on social media, someone on a Pilates forum somewhere, whether it's the Breathe Education Students Group or or a bunch of other Pilates um, groups that I'm a member of, you know, in the UK, the US, Australia, someone saying, you know, what is the what is the usual price for Pilates classes in my region? You know, I'm in X Y Z town in X Y Z country. What should I charge? So. Uh, you know, I think that the 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 assumption behind that is, well, you know, whatever everyone else is charging, that's what I should be charging as well. Uh, and I, I really want to uh, challenge that assumption that you should charge based on what other people are charging. Uh, the last, the the third kind of, I think, you know, red flag for, you know, do you have a pricing problem is um, you don't have a pricing strategy. Um, and including if you're not sure what a pricing strategy is. So, uh, and a pricing strategy is not some big complicated thing. It's super simple, um, but it just means basically being intentional about your pricing, having a reason why you're charging a particular amount, not that's what everyone else is charging. Uh, and you, you know, you've, you've created that strategy to maximize the value that you provide for your best clients and to maximize the profitability of those interactions. So those are kind of the assumptions that we're working under that, or the assumption that we're working under is that you want to have more of your best clients and make more profit from them and fewer of the, those painful clients who show up late for class and don't pay on time. And, you know, you know, you know, the clients I mean, right. The painful ones. And then you've got those clients that are joy, a joy to work with, you know, cause they're always early and if they can't make it, they tell you three days in advance and they always pay and they, you know, all of, never quibble about the price Well, you want, and they send you referrals and stuff. Well, you know, we want more of those clients. So I think the first thing I want to talk about is the concept of value. And 
I think value is very is a very subjective uh, thing. It's very individual. Like what one person values, another person doesn't value. Like some, some people want to pay more for what to them is a value is a more valuable product or service, while other people don't value that at all. For example, some people are. Uh, you prefer to pay more for organic food, whereas some people prefer to pay less for home brand food. Right? And if if you take that home brand food to the organic food people and say, "Hey, you could have these those eggs, you know, for a quarter of the price," they'd be like, "No, I don't want them. I'd rather pay four times more <laughs> and have the organic ones." Right, and likewise, if you took the organic eggs to the people who buy the home brand eggs and say, "Well, here are these eggs; they're so much better than the ones you get," and the, that person would say, "No, I don't see them as any better. They're the same eggs. Why would I want to pay four times as much for the same eggs?" Right. So, the, the, to one person, there's no difference between organic and conventional. To the other person, there's all the difference in the world. It's worth four times as much. Right. And so one person happily pays that difference and the other person wouldn't pay it in a pink fit. So that value, what that product is worth to that person is very subjective. It's individual. Uh, Another, other examples are airline tickets. Okay. So you can fly from, you know, point A to point B. Okay. Now you can pay just, um, I'm just, I'm familiar with uh, say Melbourne to Sydney, which is about a thousand kilometers, 600 miles. And so you can, you know, you can fly from Melbourne to Sydney return for about a hundred dollars. If you book far enough in advance on a cheap airline on a ticket that's non-refundable, okay, with no leg room and no food included, or you can also fly from Melbourne to Sydney return for about $3,000 if you book the same day and fly first class, right? In the same plane, Right, so the, the the what you're purchasing, like the the transportation from Tullamarine Airport to Kingsford Smith Airport, right, exactly the same thing. So why do some people pay three thousand dollars and other people only pay a hundred dollars for the same thing? Well, what do you get in first class that you don't get in Tiger Airways economy? Well, you get the flexibility of booking last minute or cancelling and rescheduling and that kind of thing. Okay, if 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 you want the hundred dollar tickets, you've probably got to fly it, fly at five in the morning or 10 in the evening. Um, you don't get any leg room. You don't get access to the first class lounge. The first class, you know, people get champagne and glass of orange juice when they sit in the plane and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. So there are all of these things. Now, some of you are probably thinking, gee, that'd be awesome to, you know, to have all of those first class perks. That sounds like it's worth $3,000. If I had 3000 you know, I would buy that, right? Some of you are probably thinking, what idiots to waste $3,000 on those useless things when you could fly to Sydney for, you know, one thirtieth of the price, right? So that is an example where airlines very cleverly sell exactly the same product to different people at different prices by packaging that product in a way that makes it more or less valuable to that person. Does this concept make sense? Other examples are cars, right? I mean, you can buy you can buy a secondhand Toyota Corolla from nineteen ninety for like two thousand dollars, right? Or you can buy a brand new Maserati for two hundred thousand, right? Gets you from point A to point B just the same. So you know, why is one more valuable to one person and not to the other person? Same reason. Okay. Um, you know, and we all have these things, you know, phones, you know, do you have a particular brand of phone that you prefer over the cheaper brand? You know, do you prefer to go to a certain cafe where they serve a particular type of almond milk or do good latte art or has a nice view or they play the sort of music that you like or the service is friendly rather than having a home brand uh, instant coffee at home? Okay. So it's the same stuff, basically, you know, coffee, beans and water. So, you know, we all have the, we all have certain areas that we, where we value things more highly than other people and certain areas where we don't value, you know, we shop on price. You know, there are probably some things where you wouldn't dream of paying more and you just want the cheapest one. Okay. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's not a good or a bad thing. It's just a, it's just a thing. 
Um, cause you know, most of us don't have the luxury of just buying the most expensive one of everything. You know, we have to choose where we spend our money. So we, we get to, you know, we get to choose what's more valuable to us. So I, I'm going to argue that you should, uh, f- you know, you need to know what's valuable to your clients, right? Okay, great. Pilates classes. Yeah, we all know they like Pilates classes, but that's like saying it's an airline ticket. It's a ticket from Melbourne to Sydney, right? But why would I pay 30 times more for one ticket to Sydney than someone else would pay, right? What makes that so much more valuable to me? Well, what what things do your best clients value? Okay, we'll come back to that in in in, in, in a little bit of a minute. But I think, you know, I guess the core concept that I'd, I really like to, to communicate here is that if you think you're just selling a Pilates class, well, you're basically selling home brand instant coffee, right? You're selling the undifferentiated version. You're selling Tiger Airways, okay? Why not sell Qantas first class? You know, why not sell an organic almond latte with latte art with a beautiful view and a friendly service and great music, right? And fantastic people watching, like sell, you know, the, the intangibles that go around your service that make it hugely more valuable to your best clients. For example, the ability to book further in advance, right? I mean, some people, for some people, people who have more money than time, right? time is more valuable than money. They'd, I would rather spend money to save myself time, right? If you say to me, here's my Pilates class, you can only book a week in advance, okay? So every Sunday night at 11.59 p.m., I've got to be sitting there on my computer ready to book my next week's classes so I don't miss out, right? If you say to me, for 10 bucks a week extra, you can book a month in advance, I'll be like, I'll take it, right? Because that lets me book into all the empty classes, <laughs> okay? Okay. And I, I, that's nothing, 10 bucks a week, phew, don't even notice it, right? So to me, that's a bargain. I'd pay 20 bucks a week for that. Does that kind of make sense to you? And then there's somebody else who would rather save the 10 bucks a week and sit there at 11.59 and, you know, book into the classes. And they'll think, great, I saved 10 bucks a week, awesome, right? And so it's. I'm not saying you should put your prices up and let everyone book a month in advance. I'm saying that will be valuable for some people and not valuable for other people. And you should price it accordingly. Does that make sense? All right. Now, there are lots of other things that you could create value, you know, ways that you could create value. I've thought, I've got a whole list here that I've thought of, but what do you think? You know, what are some of the things that you think you could provide value? That's not just like we teach better Pilates because everyone says that, Right. So how can you make your better Pilates classes that you're already teaching more valuable to somebody who's, that they're going to pay like, oh, I'll pay an extra 10 bucks for that class. What are your thoughts? Any ideas? What do people, what do people complain about at your studio? Having less people in the class. Bam. We have a special class. It's only got X number of people in it. Usually our classes have this number of people in it but we have a certain number of classes where we only allow a maximum of whatever number, right? And those classes cost this much more, right? And when you do the math in your head, the the amount that they cost extra has got to be more than enough to make up for the fact that you've got fewer people in the class. Does that make sense? So it's not like we have half as many people in the class and the class is 50% more cost because then you're still making less money, (laughs) right? It's like we've got half as many people in the class and the class is three times the price, right? And the, here's the thing, 90% of people will be like, no way, I'd rather do the cheaper class. But some people will be like, oh, that sounds good, right? So you don't fill your timetable with those classes. You have a couple a week, right? And if there's a demand, bam, every time you teach one, you're like, yes. <laughs> what else? Marcella says, my studio has a wellness space with active wear and candles. The reception area has warm tea and free water, incense burning during class and premium weights, eight beds and a personal attention. The clients love it, but some still want cheaper like other studios. So I struggle to communicate these additional elements that make the studio more of an experience, which a few of my regulars have joined the studio specifically for. Huh. Well, what a great example, Marcella. So some people are 
perfectly happy. They prefer to pay a bit extra for an experience, right? Other people don't want the experience. They just want to work out and they want the cheapest, quickest workout possible, right? My wife, I mean, I don't know how much, I never look at the credit card statements, but I'm, I reckon it's like $250 she pays for a haircut. Does that sound about right? You guys are female, most of you, right? You know, it's, and, and so she was raving to me about this hair, hairdresser, you know, a few years ago. Oh, you should visit this hairdresser. It's amazing. It's amazing. My best hairdresser I've ever had, you know, out of this world experience. Once you have a hairdress, haircut by this person, you can't go back to other hairdressers. Like, you know, you're a changed person. There's two parts of your life before and after you have a haircut with this person. Like, it was just amazing. Rave, rave, rave. So one day she got me along there. I was like, okay, look, you know, let me experience this once in my lifetime. <laughs> you know, ten, $250, it's like I spend that on 10 haircuts. You know, that's 10 haircuts for me. That's like how much I spend on haircuts in a year. <laughs> okay. But, you know, give it a go, whatever. So I went along and it was amazing. You know, you sit there, the first thing that happens is you walk in, they greet you by, you know, shake your hand, walk you in, give you a latte with a tiny teddy on it, you know, offer you a sample of magazines. No one's ever touched them before. They're all still in the plastic wrapping. They bring you over to the chair. The lady gives you a head massage and a shoulder massage and they wash your hair. And then the stylist comes and looks at magazines with you and flicks through and goes, oh, what were you thinking? Do you like this? Do you like this? And they want to really hear your story and understand what head cut you want. Then they, you know, then the lady comes and, you know, sets you all up and puts the stuff on you. And then the stylist comes and snips, 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 snips. And then the lady comes and gives you another head massage and another latte with a tiny teddy. And by the time you get out of there, it's, it's literally three hours, right? Worst haircut of my life. Not because the haircut was bad, but just because like, holy shit, I don't want to spend three hours on a haircut. You know, I want to walk in. I want to say no more than five words to the barber and I want to be out of there in 15 minutes with a haircut, you know, and I don't want to pay more than $30, right? Total waste of my money. Best thing she's ever bought. She goes back every single time. Wouldn't go anywhere else, right? I much prefer the $25 guy down the corner where I walk in, literally I walk in, he doesn't say a word, he grunts, he motions at the chair you know, the chair's open. I walk down and he goes, what do you want? I'm like, number one on the side. He's like, okay, that's it. That's the last words of the spoken. Cut, 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 cut. 10 minutes later, paying the 25 bucks, out I go, right? So maybe, you know, Marcella, if, you know, your your option would be, well, maybe those aren't your clients, right? The people who want the the cheaper version because they don't want the, the $250 haircut. They want the barber haircut, okay? Or maybe open up a second room next door, okay, put 20 reformers in it and make that one cheaper, right? And that way you've got two options. Experience, it costs a bit more, you know, cheaper, but hey, it's you and 19 other people in the room. Any other thoughts? Priority booking from Renee. I reckon that's, I'd pay more for that. You know, do you have people complaining, oh, I couldn't get into, you know, so-and-so's class on a Monday because it's booked out? Hey, well, for $10 a week more, you get to book before everyone else. Jennifer asks, so how do you package your service to increase the perceived value? Well, it depends on what they value, right? So that's why I asked, like, what do people complain about at your studio? Right? Do they complain about, like, late cancellation when, when, when they can't cancel at the last minute and you charge them for it? Do they complain about, you know, having too many people in the class? Do they complain about not having private lockers? Do they, you know, what do they complain about at your studio? Russ, um, my clients don't complain about anything, but they always sort of say, they love the challenge and variety of class because I use a lot of like, so we do mat work on Zoom, a lot of like ham weights and Swiss balls and rollers and therabands. And so they just kind of want more of that. So then how do you, if you're not going to kind of notably change your offering, how do you then increase the price? Uh, well, all how right, do you so, position that? Yeah. All right. So, well, I would say, well, I'm going to argue that you should, have different offerings at different value points um, because most people prefer to choose the, which product they buy rather than say, hey, we've only got one option, you have to buy it. Um, and it makes it much easier to have a higher price point if, you're, if you've also got a lower price point. And that way people don't feel like you're kind of shoehorning them into 
you know, one one option. But can can I bookmark that and talk about it uh, in a minute? Um, because I think that you know what what I'm you know I'm seeing a few comments here in the in the chat about um, you know the quality of what you offer, and I think what I'd like to um, you know what I, what I really want to try and help you do is pivot your thinking away from that. I'm not saying don't offer quality. Like I'm so, I'm assuming that you already do offer quality, and that's why we don't need to talk about it, right? I'm not going to tell you how hey, you should offer quality because we'll agree on that. But what I'm saying is the quality that happens inside the classroom, right? There's the studio down the road. They also get it there, right? Or, you know, or even there are clients within that classroom who all want quality, okay? Some of them would value having more options in the week or being able to book further in advance or not having to give you a day's notice to cancel or being able to come you know, only once a week and have their spot reserved or, you know, having their own private locker that no one else could use. Or there are probably a dozen other things that you could, you know, add in, um, you know, writing, adding a home program for that person, Um, uh, individual tailoring of the workout, Um, you know, instructors with different levels of qualification, uh, different class sizes. Okay, so you might offer Zoom classes with a maximum of 10 people and they've got a higher price and there's Zoom classes with a maximum of 50 people and they've got a lower price. Okay. Um, or you might offer a package that's a Zoom class plus a home program, okay, where you get a once a month, you know, update of your program. Or Zoom classes taught by a high, more highly qualified instructor. Or Zoom classes where you can book further in advance or there's more flexibility in the scheduling and cancelling window, for example. So those are all ways that, you know, none of it's got to do with whether you're teaching good Pilates or not, right? So I'm just assuming that you're already doing that. And and so I guess what I'm what I'm really interested in helping you, uh, cha- how I'm really interested in helping you change your thinking is to think about, okay, what about all of the intangible things that go around that, that, add a lot of value for some people, but other people don't value. And Natasha says, my clients want to be known and want me to check in on their bodies and how they're feeling. I can't do that with 20 people. So people who want the emotional support pay for it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And there might be people, if you've got, and I don't know how many people you've got in your class, Natasha, um, but you know, however many, if it's more than one, right, there are probably going to be people in that room who would pay even more to have even fewer people in the room. Right. Like if you like being in a class with six people, well, there are going to be some of those people who would pay even more to be in a class with just three people or two people or one person, okay? And they will pay commensurately more for that or even more personal attention out of class, like a a weekly, you know, check-in or personalized programs or, you know, testing and retesting of their strength and flexibility and things like that, that you might do on a, you know, monthly basis or, you know, whatever period for them every six weeks, say. You know, like a lot of personal trainers do a once a month or once every six weeks results session where they basically go, okay, what were your goals when you started? And then they'll measure their weight and their waist circumference and their how many push-ups they can do or whatever. Go, hey, you're improving in this area or, you know, not. And and you could set up something like that. It wouldn't have to be to do with weight and push-ups. It could be to do with, hey, what's this exercise that you're working towards doing? I want to be able to do snake or twist or full standing splits or something, right? And you could help people work up to that with a customized you know, thing. And this would not be all of your clients. It might be only 10% of your clients, right? But you should price it, you know, accordingly. So every time you sell one of those, you're like, yes, <laughs> I sold one of those platinum packages. <laughs> okay. And then that you might have only three clients in your whole practice who are on that platinum level, right? But every time you see one of them, you get a big smile because you think, yeah, this is my best client. <laughs> right. And, and, and when we come to the pricing strategy, it makes a big difference there as well. Okay. It makes it actually easy to sell the cheaper product as well. All right. So, so, all right. So idea number one, things are, you know, different people value different things, right? And some people find certain things highly valuable, whereas other people find those same things to be completely worthless and wouldn't pay for it in a, in a pink fit. And yet we tend to just package up everything and give everyone the same price. Right? Even though some people in that room would probably prefer, like in Marcella's case, some people would prefer to be in a bigger class that was cheaper 
and some people would prefer to be in a smaller class that was more expensive. Um, I think in terms of setting your price, you know, based on the value that you provide, I think, you know, I, I get a lot of, I, ha, I actually get a, quite a lot of questions and, um, you know, this morning, just, just before we started, uh, you know, I was, um, you know, chatting with, with Aaron and Aaron was saying, oh, I'm in a rural area, you know, regional New South Wales and, you know, people don't have the disposal income around here that, you know, they have in the big city to splash out on designer Pilates classes. Well, um, I guess, uh, you know, my response to that is, well, there are going to be some people there that don't, right? But is there a fancy restaurant in your town where, where I can buy a bottle of wine for $80 if I want? There's not. There's not a vineyard near town where people can go and have a three bottle of wine lunch and some, you know, really expensive cheese and stuff like that. You know, like if I'm a, if I'm a rich Sydneyite and I travel to your town, what do I do on the weekend? Right. I, because I bet you anything, there are places where I could spend my high disposable income in your town, right? Whether it's a restaurant or a boot clothing boutique or a spa or, you know, I don't know what's, you know, I don't know now, right? probably last time I drove there, through there, it was the fish and chips shop on the corner or whatever <laughs> in 1995. But I bet you anything that there is somewhere in town that if I'm, if I'm a Sydney business person on $150,000 a year, I can go down to Nara and have a jolly good weekend with good quality wine and food and a massage and maybe some hot oil dripped on my face by the massage therapist and all of that stuff. Right. And I will gladly pay through the nose for that. Right. And so why can't you be part of that strata of the market? Right. And I bet if I can go to your town, I can also buy a hamburger and a box of chips for $5. Right. And you get to choose which end of the market you want to position yourself at. So I'm not saying one's better than the other. Right. But if you are at the hamburger and chips end, well, you've got to sell a lot of hamburgers and a lot of chips because you only make five cents on every one, right? Whereas if you're selling a $250 bottle of wine and a, you know, thousand dollar a day spa treatment, well, you don't have to sell that many of those, you know? So, you know, that's, that's a, a positioning decision for you to make. And, you know, if you do decide to make, you know, that positioning decision where you want to be more at the, the upmarket end, Okay, well, you've got to understand what do those people value? You know, well, they, I think, you know, Marcel's got it right. They value experience, you know, as in having an experience. You know, they don't want to, they don't want daggy surroundings. They don't want home brand toilet paper. You know, like they want nice things and they want, they want everything slick. Okay. And they want convenience. They want your booking system to work perfectly and, you know, all of that stuff. And they want good air conditioning and, you know, I mean, you know what the things are, right? Um, whereas the hamburg, you know, if you go into a hamburger shop and it's not air conditioned, it's like, it's slightly annoying, but it's not going to stop you going back there next time. Right. But if you go to the Hilton hotel and the air conditioning is not working, it's like, fuck that. I'm not going back there. <laughs> right. Pay these prices. Okay. So, so you have different expectations at, at, you know, different price points. And so if you want to raise your price point, you just got to meet the, the expectations of the people in that price range. And I guarantee you there are those people in your town. And if you just look down the road and go, oh, the Pilates studio down the road is charging $15. Well, that's the ham they're the hamburger and chips people, right? So, you know, don't, don't copy them. You know, if, if little Johnny jumped, jumped off a cliff, would you jump off a cliff? All right. So, so I think, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't charge what other people are charging. What I'm saying is you shouldn't choose your prices just because someone else is charging that, right? If you choose your price based on what you want to provide to your client and just so happens that someone else also charges that, fine, right? But don't just look around and copy everyone else and go, oh, I'm just going to do what they're doing. When you do want to raise your, raise your price, um, there are two ways I would go about it. Um, uh, and one's to do with having a pricing strategy. But, 
you know, before we move on, like, does it, do you guys have any questions or input that you'd like to add? You know, does anyone disagree with what I've just said or want to unpack it a bit more? Um, just about pricing on value rather than choosing your price based on what everyone else is charging or what you perceive as being like a fair price, you know, in your area. You know, if you violently disagree with me, I'd love to hear it. And I won't be in any way put out. Because like I said at the start, this is subjective, right? This isn't, you know, truth with a capital T. This is just what I reckon. Natasha says, I've noticed that when the prices are too low, people assume sometimes the quality is low also, right? Well, so what about, um, all right, I mean, what's something that, that a lot of people on this call, I mean, I don't know, right? But do, do you guys like shoes? Anyone like shoes? No? What's something that you spend money on that other that I would look at and go, I can't believe you spent that much on that thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> what do you spend a lot of money on that someone else, maybe your partner, Right. Says like, Lululemon. I can't believe you spent that much. Lululemon. Lululemon. All right. So Lululemon, how much is a pair of Lululemon leggings? $130. $130. All right. What if I said, well, why is a Lululemon leggings $130? I mean, I can go to Cotton On and get them for $20. So why, why, why do you, what do you get for $130 that you don't get for $20? I just feel better. <laughs> They look better. They don't change. They're just, they're, they're great. So there's a quality. There's a quality to them, the way they fit, yes. the way they, they wear, you know, the way they, they age, you know, they maintain their, their shape. All right. What if I said to you, I could get you an identical pair of leggings that I bought in Thailand for $5? Would you take them? No. <laughs> they're identical. But it's an experience that you get at Lululemon. They look after you. They put you in a changing room. They go and get you the sizes. <laughs> it's not just the leggings. You get everything else with it. Right. And, and is there also some part of that when you're wearing them and you know that they're Lululemons, not cheap Thai knockoffs of Lululemons? Yeah. You know, when you buy the Giorgio Armani and you look close and it's Giorgio, Ar Giorgio Armoni or something, they've spelt it just a little bit wrong. <laughs> Is there something? Is there something in the fact that you know it's a Lululemon as compared to a copy, or not? Mm, for me, yes. I don't know. It's me. You, how could how could it be the same? Like for five dollars? Like I mean, I don't know. Well, why do you think Lululemons are one hundred and thirty dollars? Oh, you you pay the brand, that's for sure. Do you think? Do you think? All right. Do you think Lululemons? cost seven times more to manufacture than cotton on? No. No. Is there seven is the material seven times more expensive? Do they use really, really incredible like thread? You know, I'm sure it's better, right? But I mean, is it seven times more expensive to manufacture it? I doubt it. So what do you why is it seven times more expensive? How do you think they choose their prices? Do they look at cotton on and go, what are they charging? We should charge the same amount? No, I think that they provide a better service. Like the, the shop looks better. Um, the, sh the shape, like the design of the clothes as well. The patterns. And, yeah. Right. And so do you think that they know their customers? Yeah, and then now they know their brand is valued for who they are and, then, you know, oh, it's a Lululemon. Is that your new Lululemon? It's become a brand that, you know, a renowned right. brand that people talk about. And so now they can just go super high. People will keep buying it. And what about, but there are a lot of people who buy cotton on, right? I mean, that's a business. They're, they're still going, cotton on. So oh, yes. They, yeah. So a lot of people buy cotton on. So why does someone buy a $20 pair of leggings when they could spend $130 and get Lululemons? Because they don't value those intangibles like the service. Yeah, I don't care about service. Just give me no, the cheapest yeah. leggings. <laughs> mm, mm. That's my daughter. She's she's fourteen. She's like one hundred thirty dollars. That's how much I spend on clothes in a year. You know, <laughs> <laughs> give me the cheapest ones. And I think it. Um, 
it all comes back to values, you know, like I really love, um, if you look at Patagonia's business model, um, I think they had a story where their business almost completely plummeted. And because they, you know, they said, we're not backing down on our values. Um, yep. They're on doing, and, yeah. yeah. And being really ethical with how things are sourced. They said, we'll, we'll lose our business on our values. And that's why Patagonia costs so much, but people are happy to pay it because right. they feel like they're buying into um, when I buy this flannel, I'm actually giving back to the environment. I'm giving people jobs in other countries. And I think that what I've been learning in the Pilates world is what you value as a business owner um, will be communicated to your clients. So if it's kind of all, if you don't have good values for the business, people will be able to see that pretty quick. But if you can establish, hey, this is what we value, then people will be like, oh, I want to buy into that. Right. Um, and so what would the Pilates equivalent of that be? How could you be the mm. Patagonia of Pilates studios? What would that look like? Um, just as I'm thinking, I really try to emphasize on people matter. Like that's a big thing for me. Um, and I think when people feel really valued, um, they will want to pay for that because I, I really believe in the biopsychosocial model um, that they're there because they want to feel good. They're there because they're in pain, um, but they're there because they want to move again and they want to feel better. Um, so I think I'm still in the process of working out what does that mean? How do I show that? Um, but probably one of my top priorities is people have to feel valued. Yeah, um, 100%. So yeah, I think I'm still working that out. Mm. And I don't know, I, you know, this isn't necessarily a marketing position I would take. It might, it might be, but it just in terms of like, what's the Pilates equivalent of Patagonia? Okay. Mm. We're at, we store them, source our materials ethically. We you know we pay our suppliers ethically. We, you know, we're sustainable. All that was like, well, you could say, okay, well, we pay our instructors above award. Okay. We give mm. uh, parental leave, you know, we welcome, you know, um, pregnant and injured clients in the class. We, you know, we give discounts for people who lose their job. We, you know, like you could show that you care mm. about the community and the environment by doing certain things, right? And that doesn't mm. mean you have to like, you know, suddenly have this unsustainable business. It's like, oh, we're paying our instructors twice as much and whatever. It's like, if you probably already are paying above award, right? Just tell your customers you do it, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, offer a community class once a week where people, or offer a discount for people who are unemployed or whatever, like, mm. you know, but they can only come at off peak times. Mm. Well, if you're unemployed, you can come whatever time you want. Who cares? <laughs> come at 10 in the morning, whatever time. And, mm. and, th and that way, you know, they'll, you might sell, okay, a few classes to the unemployed people, but also the other people will feel a sense of, you know, doing good and being part of, associated with a, a virtuous, you know, ethical brand when they know that part of the class, the cost they're paying you goes towards paying your instructors fairly, goes towards, you know, subsidizing classes for people who can't afford to take the classes, you know, or maybe you buy a pair of shoes for a child in Africa every time someone buys a membership or something, right? Mm. Like whatever it might be. Now I'm not saying these are, this is what you should do. I'm just saying like that's an option, right? Of how you could build a massive value for certain people who value that, right? And my daughter would be like, no fucking way am I paying an extra dollar for that, right? Give me the cheapest pair, right? Give me the class with 20 people in it where you're paying unethically, you know, sweatshop labor all the way, right? So it's not, it's, I'm not saying you should or shouldn't do that, but, but there are things that people value, right? That are not to do with how you teach Pilates that they will pay a lot more for. Um, all right, so in terms of, um, yeah, MJ says it's similar to why girls buy LV bags, Louis Vuitton. Yes. <laughs> um, Jennifer says, uh, Lululemon aimed at certain market. They don't need cotton on customers. Yeah, they don't want cotton on customers, right? They don't want cotton on customers because cotton on customers are price buyers, right? I mean, you guys have price have had price buyers, presumably. You've had people come in and they're like, oh, the class was so awesome. I loved it. And then you show them the price list and they're like, oh, no, I can't afford it. It's too much, right? Or you've had people ring you up and go, oh, how much is a class? And you tell them, they're like, oh, no, that's too much. You must have had that, right? Or way back in the day when Groupon was a thing, do you guys remember Groupon, Scoopon, mm. any of those things? 
we used to, we tried that. It was in like 2009 or 10 or 11 or something like that. And we got like hundreds of people come through and they bought like, you know, $2 tickets or whatever to come and do Pilates. Like, oh, great. Hundreds and hundreds of people. Fantastic. None of them ever bought a full price thing, right? Because they're not people looking for Pilates classes. They're people looking for a bargain, right? They're just looking for what's on special this week. I'll have one of those, right? And this week it's Pilates. Next week it's bungee jumping. The week after it's, you know, cheap haircuts or whatever. And they just follow the bargains. So yeah, the price shoppers aren't, aren't the ones you want in my view. All right. So when, uh, you know, coming to a pricing strategy and, and, you know, it's kind of a fancy name, but basically what, it, what I mean by that is you've basically got things at different price points for different people. Okay. But not just randomly chosen. You've got, uh, I'm going to advocate that you have three, you know, maximum four, but I reckon three is a nice number of options for people. If you give too many, too many options for people, they get confused and end up buying less. Okay. I mean, have you ever been to those, um, those make your own salad places in, they sometimes have in the airports or in malls and, or whatever. When I go to them, it's like, okay, step one, choose your bowl. Step two, choose your lettuce. Step three, choose your crouton. Step four, choose your, I'm like, you've already lost me. You know, I just want a number three salad, please. You know, it, it's too complicated. So, and, or sometimes when you go to like a Chinese restaurant, they've got like 250 things on the, on the menu, right? And you can never choose what you, because it's like, oh, there's too much choice, right? Um, good. There's lots of research showing that if you, if you increase choice beyond about three or four options, a lot of people just choose nothing because they, they can't make a decision. So you end up selling less. So I reckon you should have no more than three or four options. Let's go with three because it's nice and simple. Um, and basically you should have a, a budget, a middle sized and in a premium option, right? At the base level, you think when you go to the theater, you can buy small popcorn, a medium popcorn or a ginormous popcorn, right? You can, you know, it's, it's the same with, with a lot of, you know, you go to sign up for an app. There's the, 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 the free version, the, you know, most popular version. Then there's the premium version. You know, so, the, you know, a lot of places have this sort of three option model and you should aim to sell the middle, ver the middle option, right? So the, you, you hope that most of your customers purchase the middle option. So Tess, in your case, it's corporate classes and you're charging, you know, whatever. Okay. And you want to charge a bit more than that. Okay. Well, whatever you charge a bit more, that should be like, okay, we want most people to buy that new price, right? But there'll be some people that would prefer a cheaper option with less features, Okay, and there'll be some people that prefer a more expensive option with more features. Okay. Is this kind of making sense? All right. And so, you know, again, this isn't necessarily a different class. This might just be you can book further in advance or you get a personalized program written for you or I ring you up once a week and make sure you're motivated or, you know, you can cancel at last minute without penalty or you get a free one-on-one -on -one results measurement once a month. Like there's so many ways that you could make it premium. Okay. But you have to price it accordingly. So when someone buys the premium, you're like, yes. Okay. So you think, okay, what are my clients value? Don't just add stuff that they don't want. Right. And that's why I asked like, what do they complain about? What do they, what do they ask for? What do they tell you they love the most about it? Okay. What do they wish you would do more of? Okay, or what, what frustrates them? I can't get into the thing because it's waitlisted. Or, or what if you could book in even if it was waitlisted? What if I let you book before everyone else? Okay, would that be worth more to you? Okay, so that's going to be individual depending on your particular clients. Okay, um, or there might be like a, um, um, you know, for the budget people, right? Or just say I'm a uni student or say I'm, you know, employed part-time. Okay, or say I'm a student instructor, right? People who love Pilates, but they just don't have money, right? They really want to come. They got lots of time. They're free at weird times that other people aren't free at, but they just, they, they're not going to buy you $50 a week membership because that's how much they spend on their food every week, right? Well, what if you had an off-peak membership that they could only come at the, uh, you know, what are the ghost town classes on your timetable? You know, for us, it was always like 7 p.m. Thursdays, you know, Sundays was dead because we were in the city central business district. Um, you know, 10 a.m. on weekdays, 
you know, these are the times that you just couldn't get people in the door in the studio that I worked at, right? Whereas Mondays, 5 p.m., it was like a waiting list there around the block, okay? So what if you had a budget-priced membership that was like half the price of the of the regular one, but you could only come Thursday, 7 p.m., you know, weekdays, 10 a.m. and Sundays, right? Well, if you're, a, if you're a struggling uni student, you think, yes, 10 a.m., I'll be there every day, right, for that price, okay? Whereas if you're a $150,000 a year business executive, you're thinking, no way, <laughs> right? I'd rather have the more expensive one and come when it suits me, right? And so you're selling a different value to different people, you know, of the, it, but the, when they arrive, they get the same class, right? So it's not the class that's different. It's the stuff around the class that's different, right? Or it might be priority access to lockers, right? Or it might be, you know, all of these things that we said, it might be like, okay, we're in on the, ch- you know, the budget one though should be low maintenance, right? It might be like you have to do only self-service booking and rescheduling that we don't help you over the phone. It might be, you know, um, um, you know, a longer contract. Okay. If you sign up for 12 months, you get it for this price and it's a much lower price. Okay. So there's lots of ways that you could make it, you know, cheaper price for a lower, for less features for the, you know, you, they don't have the flexibility of canceling anytime they want. Okay. Whereas for the, the premium folk, it might be, yeah, well, you can cancel any time. You can book in before everyone else. You get a results session once a month. You get a free locker. You know, we donate five dollars to a kid in Africa every time you pay your membership. You know, all of these features that people are going to go, wow, that's freaking awesome. Okay, but most people, okay, seventy-five percent of people are going to walk in and go, twelve-month lock-in contract for twenty-five bucks a week. No, nah, that's I don't want to lock in. Right. Or off-peak membership only for 25 bucks a week? No, that doesn't suit me, right? Then they're going to look at the other end and they're going to go, $100 a week just to book two weeks before everyone else? No way, (laughs) right? That's like the $100 hamburger. I'm not going to buy that, okay? Give me the $50 a week one, right? Because that the the $100 a week one, its main job is to make the $50 a week one look like good value. So just say... Just say you uh, go into a hamburger joint, okay, and just say it's one of those, it's in an inner suburban suburb of a major capital city, and it's kind of one of those hipster hamburger joints, you know, they sell like beer on tap plus hamburgers, and it's craft beer, and you go in and they've got three options on the menu, right, and one is basic cheeseburger, right, it's just two bits of white bread, with a burger and a small fries, right? The other one at the top end is, the, it's called the $100 burger, right? And it's literally got everything on the menu on it in a burger. It's handmade. It's 100% organic. Um, it comes with a pint of, uh, you know, local brewed beer of your choice. or well, let's say unlimited local brewed beer of your choice, okay? And unlimited fries and sides. You can choose onion rings. You can choose, you know, whatever you want, have it all, right? Plus salads and all of that for a hundred dollars. And then the, the cheap one is, uh, sorry, the middle one is a regular burger. You know, it's just like what you, you know, it's a burger, it's got some stuff on it. It's got some fries on the side and you get a soft drink of some kind. Okay. And that one's $20. Okay. And then you've got the cheap one, which is $12. Right? It's just like two bits of white bread, some tomato sauce and three chips. Okay. Well, the hundred dollar one probably sounds like something you might order on your birthday one year or something, but, or maybe as a joke for your friend on their birthday, right? But doesn't it make the $20 one sound like really good value? Right? Whereas if we just said, okay, you got two burgers, one's $20 and one's $12, all of a sudden the $20 one's the expensive one. Make sense? So, I mean, when you go, when you go to, I mean, you buy software online, right? You, I mean, you buy Netflix or you buy an app for your phone or whatever, right? They always have the gold, silver, and platinum options, right? And which one's highlighted? It's usually the middle one is highlighted, okay? And you look at the most expensive one and it's like, oh, that's got all of the features, but look at the price. Holy cow, I'm not paying that much, okay? Then you look at the middle one, you're like, oh yeah, I can afford that, Right? 
It's just like, if you want to buy a Mercedes, you go, oh, how much is a Mercedes? You look, yeah, Mercedes, you know, $350,000. Oh, but then they've got the Mercedes C class. That's only $100,000. Oh, maybe I could afford that. Does that kind of make sense? So what I'm advocating in, in terms of having a pricing strategy is figuring out what's valuable to your clients, okay, in terms of the intangibles that go around Pilates, not not what happens inside the class, but all of the other stuff, right? Might be might be how many people are in the class, how far in advance they can book, you know, cancellation windows, lock-in contracts, whether they get a program written for them, you know, whatever it might be. What, a, you know, what, what, how could you build value for certain people within, you know, I'm only five or 10% of people within your clientele, right? Who are going to see that as way more like double or triple more valuable or even five times more valuable than, you know, what you presently offer, right? And then step two is, okay, how could we subtract features from what you presently offer? Okay. And like, if it was a car, we take out the electric windows and we put in the winder windows, Okay, we take out the stereo and we put in an old AM radio, we put on vinyl seats, you know, how could we take out features and give a cheaper version that is low maintenance, you know, off peak, longer lock-in contract, self-service, you know, only, you know, whatever it might be. Okay. How could you, how could you create a, a lower priced and lower featured? So they, they're paying for less and getting less. Okay. And that is for your and, but that's got to be low maintenance, right? It's got to be low maintenance because they're going to be your price buyers and you don't want to spend all your time, you know, servicing people that are buying a hamburger for $5 and you're only making five cents on it. And then you spend all your time giving service to those people. You want it, them, them to be easy customers, right? So you've got to make it lower maintenance for them, right? They don't get the service. And then the middle priced product is what you presently offer, okay? Maybe with one or two of the premium features that you're currently giving away for free, not included, <laughs> okay, or depending on what you're currently giving. And then you set your prices, right? And you just say, okay, we're going to have this pricing model. It's, it's you know, this much is the premium offer and here's what you get. Here's the middle sized offer and here's what you get. Here's the budget offer and here's what you get, okay? And then you decide what that's going to be. And and if you test and you want to put your, your middle size price up a bit, you go, well, the new middle size price is this much, okay? And then you give your clients warning. Okay. You say, Hey, dear value clients. Okay. Email or text or whatever, you know, on the 30th of June, you know, give them about a month's notice. Okay. Give them plenty of notice. So they, they know what, what to expect on the 30th of June, you know, we, our prices are, are changing, right? I wanted to give you notice cause you're a valuable customer and I really appreciate you, you know, being a client. And I want you to know that between now and then you can buy as many passes as you want at the at the present price, right? If you want to stockpile them. <laughs> okay. And I wanted to give you a heads up so that it's not a surprise for you. Right. And you just send you send that out. You might send them like two or three or four reminder emails. Hey, don't forget on such and such a date our prices go up. Here are the new prices. Here's a link to buy a pass at the present price. Okay. Um, if you're really, you know, afraid that they're gonna, you know, jump ship and I pretty confident they won't because every time we've put our prices up no one we didn't lose anyone um most of them just said oh i was wondering when you're going to put your prices up you know like i went down to the coffee shop uh that i go to sometimes and they they for years they've been you know this is you know urban melbourne right cafe latte four dollars fifty right latte art and organic almond milk and the whole thing right this is this old greek family coffee quick in quick out quick game's a good game two dollars right for espresso <laughs> like holy crap this is how they're making money right one day they terribly apologetically apologized to me profusely we've put our prices up i'm like oh about time they're like yeah it's two dollars twenty now i'm like oh. <laughs> i was expecting they put it up to five dollars or something like everybody else <laughs> but I was, like I would bet you that they put their prices up no one batted an eyelid no one cared everyone was like well why didn't you put them up a year ago right and they were probably agonizing about it for ages before they did it. So that's probably the case, you know, for you guys as well. Like if you're agonizing about it, your customers probably aren't going to be phased about it. Um, but when you do, you know, give them plenty of warning. And if you're super freaking out and you just don't have the courage to do it without doing this, you can say, hey, you know, on the 30th of June in, in 30 days, you know, our prices are going up to this. But because you're an existing customer and I highly value you, 
your price is only going up to this, right? So maybe the prices are going up from $20 to $25, but your price only goes up to $22. But for all new clients, it's $25. And if you're super, super freaking out and just don't even have the courage to do that, you can say you get to keep the same price for now, but everyone else is going up to $25, right? But I don't, I don't recommend that. Uh, yeah, so that's that's my uh, basic suggestion: is have a pricing strategy, which is just like just got a you know budget, middle, uh, regular, and premium. Okay, the premium is priced very highly, and it's for you the five percent of your customers who really value some of those intangibles, like having a personal locker or being able to book a month before everybody else or whatever it might be. Okay, you don't want to sell many of those, but when you do sell one, you want to go hell yeah, that's awesome, I sold one. Okay. And when, uh, maybe, I mean, we didn't even talk about this. You've probably got people in your studio who come five times a week. Do you have people, or eight times, anyone got someone who comes 10 times a week? <laughs> six times, I've got six times a week. All right. And I don't know, I don't know your pricing, Fanny, but, but, you know, often we have like a, you know, you might have a twice a week membership and then a four times a week membership and then an unlimited membership or something like that. Okay. And if, if someone's on an unlimited membership and they're making use of it, do the calculation. How much are they spending per class, right? If $7.50. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, they're not no, your best customers. No, I regret customers. not capping yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So mm. you need to cap it, right? Because that person, they love your service so much they come six times a week and yet they're your worst customer because they're paying $7.50 per class. Mm. Imagine if your classes were full of people paying $7.50 each. You'd be bankrupt. Yeah. Is it okay to cap it now? Like, like if I feel like giving something and then taking it back? Right. So, well, here's what I would advise, right? Do a twice a week membership, a four times a week membership, and then just go, okay, if you want to do more, you can do more, but you just, it's just a, it's an extra membership, right? So if you want it for, for every extra weekly class you want to add on, it's an extra $12 or $15 or whatever, right? But that's not a, that's not a casual payment, right? That is if you want a five times a week membership, it's $15 a week more than the four times a week membership. If you want a six times a week membership, a seven times a week, a 27 times a week membership, it's just $12.50 or $15 or whatever extra on top of it, right? That. So if there's somebody who wants to come six times a week, they're going to pay six to- for six times a week, right? And every time they come, you're like, yes, that person's coming because they're paying good money and they're coming so often. So I would say, I wouldn't, no, don't cap it because that prevents them from doing what they want to do, right? They want to come six times a week. Why say you can't come six times a week, right? Say, hell yeah, come six times a week. It's going to cost this much. So, but yeah, but I, like they bought an unlimited and now I'm going to say, oh, this is not available anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if they truly are your best customers, right? Well, how do you know if someone's your best customer? Right. If I said to you, who are your best customers? Well, how can you tell who those people are? You see them every day. <laughs> you see them every day. Or I just say I hang around your studio every day. I'm the, I'm the hobo that lives outside, but I come and hang around your studio and, and sit on your couch all day. Does that make me your best customer? How do you, how do you know someone's your best customer? They're not price sensitive and they refer other people to you. Yeah, they buy everything you've got to sell. Right, and they send you their friends, <laughs> right? And they're you know, and they're a pleasure to work with, and they love what you you know, like they love what you do, and they they you know all of that stuff, right? So these people that are coming six times a week, they're not your best customers. Mm. They could be your best customers, right? If you charge them for six classes a week, they could be your best customers. But right now, they're not your best customers. Now, if you say to them, it's going to be hard because if you've train them up to come for 750 a class, right? But if they truly are your best customers, right? They won't care, right? If you say to them, look, hey, and this is not a generic email that goes out, right? Because there's not many of these people, right? There might be only three, three or four of those people. You email them and you person write a customized personal email to each of them. You go, hey Fanny, I just want you to know I freaking love having you as a client. Right, and I mean that sincerely. And here are the five reasons I love having you as a client, and they've got to be specific to you. Okay, I love that when you come in, you tell me about how your pet parrot is every week, and I love that you know you always take the reformer in the corner of the room, and I love that you never do legs and straps, and I love that you you know 
tell them so that they know that you're talking specifically to them, right? And they'd say, hey, look, and but I just have to, you know, share with you that I've undercharged you, right? And it's not your fault, right? It's not your fault. It's my fault. I've been undercharging you and the price that you're paying, I'm going bankrupt. Okay. So, you know, I'm sorry, but I do need to increase the price and charge you for all the classes that you do moving forward. Obviously, I'm not going to charge you <laughs> in arrears. Okay. Mm. And I know that this is a big increase for you and it's going to go up to this much on this date, you know, give them plenty of notice. Okay. And, you know, I really, I just want to say I super value you as a client. And if you don't want to spend more, we can move you to a membership where you only do this many classes or this many classes or whatever, and it'll be this much, right? But I can't keep offering you unlimited classes for the price that I'm offering. And if, if they are your best customers, they will go, yeah, sure. No worries. Charge my credit card. Sorry. Raf, could you just re-explain um, for Fanny's example where the customer is doing like six t- six classes a week, how that sort of price increase, like how would you? Uh, I would just, yeah, I'm like sorry. Say, I kind of explained it in a convoluted way. I would just basically put together a package for that person. Like that's a person who is the, that's the premium package, right? The premium mm-hmm. package is you get to come six times a week, right? Now, a lot of people are going to go six times a week. No way. I'm not paying for six times a week. I'm only going to come twice a week, right? So they're not the customers for that. So if it's a six times a week person, right? Again, imagine who's your best customer. They're, 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 they're money rich and time poor, probably. Okay. They want service. They want convenience, but the price isn't their primary consideration. If price is their primary consideration, they're not your best customer. Okay. So just go, okay, what, what would I need to charge this person for me to jump in the air and click my heels together and go yippee every time they walk in the door, right? Every time I see their name on the timetable, I go, yes, <laughs> my seller booked another class. Fantastic. Okay. Right. What would I need to charge rather than going, oh damn, we've got, you know, the class is full. Oh no, it's full of the six time a week people. You know, I'm only making $50 on that class. So just price it accordingly. Right. So if, if I was coming six times a week and you were fist bumping every time that you saw me book, what would six times a week cost, right? But do it as a do it as a membership, not as a casual thing, right? Do it as like if you want to come six times a week, it's I would say I don't know, 120 bucks a week. Right? And if I if one week I only come five times, well, I still pay my 120, right? And what I'm paying for is the option to come six times a week. Does that make sense? Now yeah. Most, most people are going to go, 120 a week, get the hell out of here, right? But some people are going to go, huh, that sounds like a good deal, right? Because if I paid a multi-pass and came six times a week, it'd be a lot more than that, right? And, and when you present your three options on your menu, right, the premium option might be six times a week. Does that make sense for 120? And then... The middle-sized option might be, you know, four times a week for 50. Or what, it, well, the price is wrong there, but, you know, <laughs> does that make sense? So are you saying that unlimited is not really a good no. offering to have? No, well, no, because unlimited, what you're doing is you're selling capacity, right? So just say you're a gym, right? You're virgin active and you've got, you know, one square kilometre of floor space, Okay, you've got 26 beds in your Reformer Studio A and 26 beds in your Reformer Studio B. You've got 100 cycles in your spin studio. You've got 200 bits of cardio equipment. You've got a pool. You've got all this, right? You can fit, you know, 1,200 people on the premises at the same time, right? You know, of those members, and you know, just say you've got 10,000 members, you know, some of them are going to come twice a day every day, but most of them are not going to come at all. Right, most of them are not going to come at all from one month to the next, okay. And the on average, they're going to come like once or twice a week, over average over everybody, right? So you can say you can afford to say, "Hey, unlimited access for this much," because you know that almost no one's going to take you up on it, right? If you had ten thousand members and they all came ten times a week, that's the end of your business, right? You can't support that many. Right? But you know, no, then not 10,000 people are going to come that, t- you know, 10 people might come that often out of 10,000, right? But when you're a tiny studio and you've only got eight reformers, 
Well, you don't have a lot of capacity there, right? If, if you've just got eight people coming 10 times a week, that's your whole timetable <laughs> blanketed, right? So you can't afford to have those people. Even one of those people significantly affects the profitability. It means you've basically only got seven reformers now because you're basically giving away that eighth reformer for free, <laughs> right? So if you're selling a premium product with limited availability, you can't afford to give away unlimited, right? Because you don't have unlimited. You've only got no. limited, right? That makes sense. You know, but if you had like a Mac membership or an online membership or something, bam, unlimited, right? Because what do you care if you've got 20 people or 50 people or 600 people in your online class? It makes no difference, right? So you can say, hey, unlimited online live classes this much per week. And that's truly a good deal for me as a client and a good deal for you as the as a purveyor, right? But if you've only got eight reformers, it's not unlimited. That's good to know. Got to change some price strategy there. <laughs> Um, Andrea said, I run a small group reformer studio and haven't had a price increase for three years. So I was going to give my clients a month's notice and increase the prices as of July 1st this year. But now with COVID ring, it's ugly head again. I'm not sure if this is the right time to do it. Andrea, do it, do it, do it, do it. And we have, uh, this is the last thing I'd like to finish with. I know we're a little bit over time, but, um, uh, you know, we have this, you know, all of us in this industry, I think, you know, are very, um, you know, we're very we have great ethical sensibilities, right? We don't want to rip people off, okay? And we're aware that in COVID, you know, a lot of people are losing their jobs and their businesses and whatever, but a lot of people aren't, okay? If I'm, a, if I'm an accountant or a digital marketer or an executive in a corporation, my income's unaffected. In fact, I'm now earning just as much and spending a lot less because I'm not going out to dinner every night with my cronies in the city because I'm working from home. I'm not paying for childcare, I'm not paying for taxis, I'm not paying to have my suits cleaned because I'm working in my pajamas all day. Like actually my, my disposable income has gone up, right? And now you're proposing to give me a discount so that you can have the privilege of eating ramen noodles. You know, that doesn't make sense. If you want to help people who have lost their jobs, put a specific price. If you've lost your job due to COVID, you get this discount, right? But don't just drop the price for the people who don't want it dropped, right? I don't want a price drop. I want to pay full price. Yeah, just say, hey, we're putting our prices up. Hey, by the way, everybody, if you're in financial difficulty because of COVID, just let me know and you can have a cheaper price. No problem. I don't want you to miss out on Pilates. Great idea. Thanks, Raf. But don't don't just drop the price for everyone. Hmm. Don't discount the first class tickets. You know. So yeah, I would say now is the perfect time to put your prices up and uh, give them a month's notice and let them know. And you don't have to tell them why, unless you're Fanny and it's your two potential best clients, right? Because right now they're not your best clients, but they might turn into your best clients. Okay. And if they do turn into your best clients, then I think, you know, 15 minutes to craft them an individual email is not excessive. But if you're just sending a blanket communication out to everybody, you don't have to tell them why. People put their prices up all the time. You know, my insurance company sends me a notice saying your prices are going up. Do they tell me why? No, it's just the prices are going up. Right. Netflix puts the prices up. Do they tell you why? No. Do you care why? No. It's just all you care is like, how much is it going to be? You know, that's all you want to know. That's all they want to know is like, how much is it going to be? Okay, cool. That's fine. Why an email and rather than talking to them face-to-face? -face? Even better face-to-face, -face, but definitely put it in an email as well because often their memory of what was said will be radically different to your memory of what was said. So just say, hey, I'll put this in an email for you just so you've got a record of it. Thanks. Because then when they go, hold on, how come you've charged me 120 a week? You never said anything about that. You can be like, oh, yeah, remember that email I sent you? Because <laughs> maybe all they hear when you ring them up is like, oh, it's so great to hear, you know, talk to you and I love the way you choose the reformer in the corner. And then they just say blah, 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 blah after that. You know? All right. Thanks so much for, for your contribution. Uh, if you are watching this afterwards um, or if you were participating and felt a bit bashful about contributing or asking a question, 
Uh, I'd love to have your feedback. If you agree or disagree or have different thoughts, I'd love to hear those. Um, and if you have questions, I'd love to hear those. Just pop it in the chat under the video post in Facebook. Hope you guys have a great week. See ya. Thanks again. Thanks, Raf. Raf, if you have a minute, um, can I just ask, uh, I've got a client with solitary sclerosis. Is it something you know anything about? Never heard of it. Never heard of it, but it makes sense that because there's something called multiple sclerosis that there would be a solitary sclerosis. So sclerosis uh, means uh, a hardening. Um, so you can have atherosclerosis, and in multiple sclerosis, it's it's the nerve uh, surroundings. So yes. solitary sclerosis, I know nothing about. I'm sorry, but let me let me look it up quickly. Okay, lobar sclerosis, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, medial sclerosis, mesial temporal sclerosis, multiple sclerosis, myelinoclastic diffuse sclerosis, neural sclerosis, nuclear sclerosis, progressive systemic sclerosis, renal sclerosis, systemic sclerosis, annular sclerosis, tuberous, vascular, venous, arterial, arterioli, arteriola, diffuse, hyperplastic, insular, intimal and lateral. <laughs> so it, you sure it wasn't insular sclerosis? Maybe you misheard. No, it says, um, he, 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 he put as, um, hold on. Um, Tracy has slowly progressive asymmetric myelopathy with cervical cord lesion, lesions. This might be described as solitary sclerosis. Huh. So it's uh, myelopathy. Uh, asymmetric myopathy. Progressive asymmetric myopathy with cervical cord lesions. Myopathy. My myelopathy. Oh, myelopathy, yep. Sclerosing myelopathy or transverse myelopathy. What did they say? Asymmetric. I'm not sure if that means transverse. He said in the sense that there is no not widespread that dissemination in space and time typical of multiple sclerosis. Hmm. Can you read, read out the whole diagnosis again, please? She has a slowly progressive asymmetric myelopathy with cervical cord lesions. This mm -hmm. might be described as solitary sclerosis, although there are two lesions, both in the cervical cord, in the sense that there is no widespread dissemination in space and yeah. time typical of multiple sclerosis. Yeah, so it's myelopathy, which is a hardening of the spinal cord, which okay. basically means it's, it's uh, so uh, multiple sclerosis is where it affects the central nervous system so often in the brain. And spinal okay. cord, and so you can have really diffuse symptoms in multiple sclerosis, and the, the symptoms can jump around because it's in the brain. It could be in your right arm one time, in your eyes another time, in your left leg another time, and so you know it's it's very you know diffuse, you know varied symptoms. I would guess, based on the fact that this is more focal, it's more localized, it's in a specific yes, yes. you know area, it's cervical, um, that it would have a you know symptoms in the specific nerves. Uh, you know, body areas, you know, innervated by that nerve. So mm -hmm. I, it doesn't say which nerve it is, um, but, you know, if it's the nerve roots that exit the lower neck, it would be the arm that's affected. If it's the upper neck, it might be like the… Yeah, no, you know. it's, it's at C3. It says C3, so it's all in the right arm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, so, uh, I, you know, I don't know, but based on, you know, what the anatomy is telling me here in Tabor's Online Medical Dictionary and also my understanding of multiple sclerosis, I would initially I would treat it just like basically it's multiple sclerosis, but it's mm -hmm. it's more localized and it's probably not going to jump from her arm to her leg to her whatever. 
but it, it's probably, you know, in many respects going to be similar to multiple sclerosis. So I'll just look, mm-hmm. up in, look up in the ACSM guidelines and basically treat her like she's got multiple sclerosis in terms of exercise, um, you know, prescription. Which guidelines did you say? The ACSMs. Um, yeah, cool. That's the new edition. Yes. The 11th edition It just came out this month, like, oh, sorry, the last two weeks. Um, the 10th edition, which is the 2018 edition, it's basically the same. So if the, the purple one, um, that's the previous edition. Okay. Um, and it's this book, if you're going to buy it, it's about $45 on Amazon or Booktopia or, you know, wherever. Um, ACSM's guidelines for exercise testing and prescription. And it's mm-hmm. it's the gold standard um, sort of definitive guideline for giving exercise to people with um, you know, healthy people and also people with m- just about every chronic condition from cancer to Parkinson's disease to multiple sclerosis to heart failure to, you know, whatever. Cool. Um, it, it'll tell you, you know, um, what exercises to do, what exercises to avoid, what special considerations, um, et cetera. And so it, it won't have, uh, you know, this particular condition because this is kind of like a pretty niche <laughs> diagnosis but it sounds to me like it's basically multiple sclerosis but a a, a variation of of that disease cool thank you so much thank you good luck yeah bye see everyone